In this topic video, we're going to focus on how we measure income inequality. I guess the first thing to say is there's an important distinction to make between income and wealth. So income is best defined as a flow of income going to factors of production. For most people, uh, the biggest source of income is the wage or the monthly salary they get from their job. But people can also generate income by, for example, owning property, which generates a flow of rental income. They may have some savings, which provide interest. And if they have shares in a business, they could get, uh, for example, the, the dividends, which is the share of the profits. So income is a flow concept. Wealth is slightly different. Wealth is best defined as the value of a stock of assets. So income is a flow concept and wealth is a stock concept. You can accumulate wealth by, for example, uh, building up your savings in a bank or building society account. You can own property, which may go up in value, or you can own stocks and shares in businesses. And many people have an occupational pension scheme. They build up wealth in uh, a pension scheme, which then provides a flow of income later on in their life after they've retired. So it's important to make a distinction, please, between income and wealth. We're going to focus on income inequality in this topic video. Here are two measures of income inequality which we often use. There are others, but uh, we'll, we'll mention them when we get to them. The Gini coefficient is perhaps the best known measure of income inequality. It's an overall measure which uh, has a value either of 1, which means perfect inequality, or 0, where there's no inequality. Clearly in the world today, all countries have a Gini somewhere in between. And we'll look at the data. Palmer ratio is an interesting one. So just a different way of looking at income inequality. And it's calculated by the ratio of the income of the top 10% of households, the richest 10%, divided by the accumulated income, or the sum of the income of the poorest 40%. So again, it's a, an attempt to measure the extent to which the richest 10% of the population have significantly more income than the income of the bottom 40% added together. And we'll look at some data on that in a few seconds. Now, to what extent is income and wealth in the UK unevenly distributed? Well, in the UK, uh, recent figures, I think these are from 2013, median income was around £21,400. Median, of course, is the middle value of the incomes in the distribution. The mean income, income per person, significantly higher, much higher, just over £30,000. And that, of course, is because uh, the mean is dragged up by the inequality, particularly right at the top of the income distribution. Average income in the UK for the top 1% was around £150,000, whereas for the poorest 1% in the UK, less than £10,000. Uh, and there's some data there on, uh, on income inequality, and in particular the, the tax payments that the richest 10% make. UK has relatively high, only, uh, relatively high inequality. Um, the poorest 10% just get 1% of total income, and the richest 10% get nearly a third. Coefficient for the Gini coefficient in the UK is around 0 0.36. There are some different measures depending on the precise methodology, but it's around 0 0.35, 0 0.36. Here are countries with really high Gini coefficients. So this is good contextual evidence to use in an exam. The Seychelles in 2012 had the highest Gini coefficient officially published in the world, and countries like Namibia and South Africa are right up there. Zambia, quite interesting, a country heavily dependent on copper mining, where much of the income and the wealth is tightly focused on the owners of factors of production. And one of the big countries is in there, of course, the two countries, of course, South Africa and Brazil, both have very, very high income inequality. A Gini coefficient above 0.5 means a lot of inequality. Here's some data on income inequality in the UK that might be interesting. So we take, for example, real household disposable income. That's income after tax and benefits, but also adjusted for the effects of inflation. So this data is in pounds per year, measured at constant 2013-14 prices. You see here that if we take the decade-long view from 1979 through to 1999, the median incomes went up in real terms. Uh, but there was a much, and uh, there's a significant increase in the mean income for the top quintile. The top quintile is the top 20%. The 80-20 ratio is the ratio of income of the top quintile 
to the bottom quintile. And you can see that went up quite sharply from just under 4 to over 6. And if you look on the right hand side here, the Gini coefficient increased from 27 to 36. In other words, 0.27 to 36. So from 1979 to 1999, there was a significant increase in income inequality in the UK. Now let's put in the latest data. This is the information which we have available up to the end of 2014. You can see that median real disposable income, if I just highlight this area here, median real disposable income has fallen in the UK since 2008. This has been a tough time for living standards in the UK. Median incomes have fallen. The mean income of the bottom quintile rose a little bit from 2008 to 2009, but again has, has actually been stagnant or falling since. And so too is the mean income of the top quintile now hovering around 60,000 per year. There's actually been a fall in income inequality in the UK since 2008, as measured by the 80-20 ratio, as you can see there, and also as measured by the Gini coefficient, which according to this data, if we just use disposable income, uh, the Gini coefficient has fallen to 0.32 or 32. Here's another way of looking at uh, income inequality in the UK. So this time we take the, uh, the quintiles. These are 20% groupings. And uh, we look at different types of income. So for example, the bottom quintile is the poorest 20% of households in the UK. They had 3% of the original income, 7% of gross income before income tax and benefits, 8% of disposable income, and 7% of post-tax income, which takes into account, for example, indirect taxes. So in other words, this group started off with 3% of income and ended up with 7% of income. If we take the top quintile, they had 50% of the original income, heavily skewed wages and salaries to that group. That share comes down because of taxes and benefits and things, and they ended up with 42% of post-tax income. Still, of course, six times higher, pretty much, than the bottom quintile. We look at the extreme ends of the income distribution. We find that the bottom ten, bottom ten percent of people in the UK had just one percent of the original income, and even after taxes and welfare, uh, they only ended up with two percent of the final income. Whereas the top ten percent had thirty-two percent of original income, and whoops, and even after the tax and welfare system had finished, they only had. They still had 27% of post-tax income. So our tax and welfare system is mildly progressive. It does help to achieve some redistribution of income and wealth, but it's not what, what, what would claim to be a radically significant redistribution effect. This data looks at similar things. This looks at income per head per household, sorry, pounds per week. And uh, you can see that the poorest households have an original income of just over £100 a week. Uh, after tax and benefits, that, that, that climbs up to just under £300 per week. Whereas the richest 20% of households have an original income of over £1,500 per week. And that drops down to about £1,100, around uh, £60,000 a year or so. So that's uh, quite interesting where the, the tax and benefit system redistributes income and wealth in the UK. Uh, a, lot, a lot of inequality in Britain, of course, comes from the labour market. And one key feature of the labour market is the huge dispersion in weekly pay across different occupations and industries. And we'll do a separate uh, topic video on this in terms of causes of wage differentials. So check out the YouTube channel for that. I think it's quite interesting, though, that uh, in the UK, 10% of people earned less than £125 in 2014. Quite significant. And at the other end of the income scale, 10% of people earned more than £900 a week uh, in terms of gross weekly pay. That's, that's pay before deductions. So we have quite a wide dispersion in wages and salaries and things, and that's one of the key causes of income inequality. So which countries in the world have the highest income inequality? Well, here we see these countries again. Let me just highlight them for you. Seychelles, South Africa, Namibia and Botswana are countries with a Gini coefficient of more than 0.6 or 60%. And you can also see here the Palmer ratio. Let me highlight the Palmer ratio for you. The Palmer ratio is the ratio of the income of the top 10% to 
divided by the income of the bottom 40%. So you can see, for example, in South Africa, which has the highest poverty ratio in the world, the top 10% of households in South Africa have an income eight times the total income of the population of the bottom 40%. Tremendously high levels of income inequality and wealth inequality, of course, in South Africa. These are the countries in the world with the lowest income inequality, and typically they tend to be Scandinavian countries or many countries in former Eastern Europe. So the country with the lowest Gini coefficient that I can find are Slovenia and Slovakia. Gini coefficients of less than 2 0.5 or 25%. And you can see here that the quintile ratio, the SATS 20 ratio, and the Palmer ratio is significantly lower for these countries. Hence, they're lower in income inequality. Now, that's a lot of data. And you might want to have to go down and lie down on a bed for 10 minutes. But you can always go back through our presentation and just look at the data in a bit more detail once again. What's the takeaway point from this presentation? That income is different from wealth. That the labour market generates a lot of income inequality in the UK that the tax and benefit system redistributes a little bit to an extent to bring down the differences. But fundamentally in the UK, there's a lot of income inequality. But income inequality is much higher in many developing countries, as we've seen. Well, that was quite a brisk look at income inequality. We'll do a separate topic video on causation and policies to reduce inequality. But I just wanted to take you through some of the data to help, uh, help you understand how we measure income inequality in a country. Thanks for joining in. Hope to see you again sometime soon.